Salam. Hi there, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Achos Twins Travel Show. This episode is about our hometown, Khujand. Khujand is the second largest city of Tajikistan and is one of the oldest cities in Central Asia, dating back about 2,500 years to the Persian Empire. Khujand was the major city along the ancient Silk Road. The very first episode of this podcast is about Khujand with our friend Farangis. She's from Tajikistan. But this time around, our guest is an expat. If you've never heard this word before, expat is a person who has moved from their native country to another country permanently or for an extended period of time. Our guest is Daniel Fernandez. He is very well respected, well known in Khujand and in Dushanbe, the capital for sure. And he is very thoughtful and a smart person. It's been a pleasure to interview him. So please enjoy our conversation with Mr. Daniel. Good morning, Mr. Daniel. Welcome. Good morning, Mr. Hassan. Mr. Hussain. thank you so much for having me on your podcast as a guest today. And I'm absolutely delighted to be on your show because, you know, I've known you for a while now. It's very inspirational to see all the things you're doing to create global awareness of all the hidden treasures of magnificent Tajikistan. And um, I can see now you've, you, you've started traveling in the near abroad and you're you're working with even more advanced media content to create more awareness in, in other markets about um, touristic treasures uh, of Tajikistan and all the culinary delights and the you know amazing quaint traditions still intact in Tajikistan. So um, I'm happy to be here. I want to say that again. And I'm going to try and answer your questions as briefly as possible. Please don't shoot me. I do get carried away. <laughs> as you know, I'm a, t- I'm a teacher. <laughs> Teachers tend to be verbose. Yeah. You asked me to tell you something about myself very briefly so that your audience knows who I am. Well, my name's Daniel Fernandez, and I'm, surprise, surprise, an Indian person born in India. I have some uh, mixed um, ancestry going back to Hispanic origins. And I'm an English teacher of all professions. Mm-hmm. It's not often you meet an in- Indian English teacher abroad, but here I am. I've um, traveled quite a bit and I've taught English in many countries when I was younger in, in East Asia and Southeast Asia. But in, in the middle years, I've, the last 25 years, I've, I've taught mostly in Russia and the CIS, the only exception being Poland and Turkey, which are outside these regions, but then uh, those are one-off countries. So I, think, I like to think of myself as an Eastern European, um, post-Soviet uh, kind of an expert, and I feel so much at home in this culture. And as you know, and, and now, now your audience won't know, I've lived in Tajikistan for about nine years. This is about eight and a half years or something like that. I, have a, I still have a contract here, so it's going to be like nine years, essentially, before I leave. I came here for the first time in 2013, and it's 2021 now. So that's about me. I'll be happy to help any of your audience if they want to ask me specific questions about Tajikistan. They are welcome to get in contact with me on Instagram or email or something like that. Oh, that's so kind of you. Uh, we'll leave the uh, your email address or maybe your Instagram in the show notes so people can yeah, reach you. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, my, my Instagram is Monsoon Daniel. Yeah, I I don't think you need any introduction in, in Hujant yeah. in our hometown because <laughs> no, everybody I'm knows you. You know, you know, mom, <laughs> she knows you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But outside that's Tajikistan, kind. yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, we wanted to make this episode from day one. If you remember last year, we told you about this idea to start podcast. Exactly, I remember that. Yeah. And it's, you know. So it's good to it's, have you. Um, it's so sad. I remember we, we, that we had this little, you know, impromptu kind of get together where we discussed um, future possibilities and stuff. And it's been over a year and well, now you started your podcast, but I still don't think you can find many podcasts or any podcasts about Tajikistan as of yet. Um, so that is... Um, it's sad that not many people want to actually talk about what's happening here or showcasing what is happening here more correctly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Daniel, why did you choose Tajikistan? Why Tajikistan? Um, you know, it's a bit like, you know, word of mouth kind of thing. You know, I, I started my career essentially by working in Russia back in the day, you know, Perestroika and Glasnost. So, you know, being Indian born, when I was born, India was a desperately poor country and we were often under embargo by the United States. And so India, because of political realities, became aligned with the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union spent a lot of money 
doing uh, propaganda. So they should publish a lot of English language books about their culture. And uh, because these books were, so, you know, ridiculously cheap, I bought all of them and read them. So, you know, rather than reading a lot of American comics, I read like Ukrainian fairy tales wow. or Russian fairy tales because they were so cheap <laughs> and very high quality paper. So I had this, um, you know, this childhood fantasy of walking in the snow and all of that. Mm -hmm. So that's how it ended up in Russia when I became a little tired of East Asia. And um, because I lived in Russia, and I, I, I developed a comfort factor with the post-Soviet culture. And then I progressed on to work in other countries. I lived in Georgia, Armenia. And um, it just became logical for people to consider hiring me because I seem to have been in the region for long enough. And I also had the requisite qualifications. So that's um, how I think my employer, my previous employer, chose me because she advertised and to just to remind you 10 years ago was in a rather dire straits you know with electricity and stuff and she she advertised and found my cv and invited a lot of people who were probably much better than me but they refused to come i happened to be in poland at that time it was the second time someone um, contacted me about working here the previous offer was from an uh, ngo based in, in london but um, they were quite, uh, you know, they're quite, they were quite liberal with the truth and, and the way they, they told me but things about things sound like, you know, put me off. And they said this was like, they were going through like a electricity shortages. It's very cold. There was no heating. And I, imagine living in Poland, which is like quite developed and has, you know, fantastic heating and well insulated homes and say, oh, you got to come here and live here and please be careful. It's very cold. You know, we hope you can adjust because you live in cold countries. Mm -hmm. So that put me off. And then like five years later, this lady called me. And so I thought, oh, here's destiny calling to me. Some higher power wants me to go there. And that's how I came. And she offered me this chance to come here and work with her to build a school. Um, uh, so I did. And I came here and I, I worked very hard with her. And the school eventually went on to become the number one school in this um, region. Wow. And where was the the first city? Dushanbe, the capital, or Hujant? Where did you start? Oh, uh, yes. You see, you know, I, I flew into Dushanbe. That's an mm -hmm. interesting story. So I flew into Dushan Bay um, quite um, late in the evening, maybe five o'clock, six o'clock. And this lady, she was from Hujant, which is, you know, as you know, it's like five, six hours away from the capital city, arranged for somebody from the airline to come take me from the international terminal, walk me to the domestic terminal, literally cram all my suitcases and, and, and shout at people. And even though I was late, you know, I was like 20 minutes late and the plane was about to, but because he was on the same airline, he just managed to oh, okay. shout to all the staff and put me on. So I, I barely saw, I never saw Dushanbe when I came. It was like many years later, I actually yeah. came to Dushanbe. Do you think it's very different Dushanbe and Kojan because you, you, you live in both um, cities? Yeah, yeah, I have, um, but you see, my initial impression of Dushanbe uh, was that it was, you know, I never saw Dushanbe when I first came here and I became used to living in Hujan, which is a very compact city. Everything mm -hmm. is within walking distance. And I sort of like, as an older person, I sort of like that. So like a, a year or two later, I had to go to Dushanbe. And the first thing that daunted me was the size like of the city because you had to travel and take so many taxis here and there. And then I also found them quite unfriendly compared to Hujandi people. Uh -huh. So those two things colored my perceptions. One, it was too big. Two people very unfriendly and rude. And the third was a way more expensive than Hujand. Many years later, many years later, seven years later, when I went to work in the Cambridge School in, 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 in Dushanbe, I, I saw that Dushanbe had changed qualitatively because it's become far more modern. I thought, I think the national government threw a lot of money in developing um, Dushanbe to be like a showcase of Tajik culture. So it, it's very nice now. It's almost like a small Baku. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, after coming back to Hujan, like after an absence of two or three years, I noticed that Hujan seems to be going in the direction. I mean, it's not as glitzy or as modern as Dushanbe is at the moment, uh -huh. but I can see it's making headway in that direction. I think five years from now, I don't think I'll be here in five years from now, but in five years from now, I think if you come back, especially you, because you were <laughs> born here, you would say it's very different. In some ways, it's reminiscent of me going back to India where I was born, because I've not been to India for like 25 years. I went to India in 2019. I was like shocked because it's like so different now. It's, it's very modern, it's very expensive, and a lot more unfriendlier than when I was a child. And probably a lot more dangerous, <laughs> urban crime and all that. Yeah. yeah. And what surprised you the most when you just moved to Tajikistan? 
Um, okay, the first thing was, you know, I'm sorry to say this, but, you know, because I've traveled a lot, especially inside the CIS in Southeast Asian countries. I'm quite old. So, you know, I, I grew up in a world which is quite poor compared to today without all the technological advancements of the modern generation. So I was pretty good at like assessing countries. And I, because, you know, I'm like Western trained, I research, I research countries, read media, try to learn phrases before I go to the country. Uh, you know, I hardly found anything, which is why I'm very glad with what you're doing. In 2012, when I got the job offer, I, I scoured the internet for information about Tajikistan and Hujan and Dushanbe. I could, fi I could find a few videos, very bleak videos, with low quality resolution because the technology is very poor in those days, of some fountains in Panchambe Square made by some Pakistani businessmen who are here for some like trade visits. Mm. That's all I could find. I could find a lot of Russian documentation, which I couldn't read. So there's literally no um, globally accessible resources. So I thought, oh, it's going to be desperately. At that time, the poorest country I'd been to was Bangladesh in the past. So I thought, oh, it'll be like Bangladesh because <laughs> your per capita income was very low. And I thought, yeah, it's going to be like that. So the first thing that hit me when I came here was, it was not like desperately poor like Bangladesh or I know some parts of Africa, though it had a very low per capita income. But it was relatively like any other Soviet city in any of the Soviet cities I've been to. And in one way, superior, because especially Hujan, I don't know about Dushan Bay, it was extremely clean. You know, as an Indian, as an Indian person, and India is like one of the dirtier countries I think I've been to, even now, but though in the recent past, they're making a headway with that new prime minister cleaning up the country. The Indians are so used to littering. So I'm, I just grew up. And though I lived in Europe when I came back, I could judge that the Indians were like dirty. Hujan and Tajikistan in general is so clean. Wow, good the other thing that. that really surprised me was that everyone was so kind. And there was very, very little crime. Very, very little crime in this country, especially Hujan. You know, I lived in Georgia, in, in, in the Caucasus at a comparable um, per capita income when Georgia was quite poor. And it had like violent crime in, in, in very large numbers. But um, in all the years I lived here, I've heard of one crime, one major crime in Hujan city. And maybe I've heard of like um, 15 crimes in eight years, 15 major crimes, which if you open a newspaper in a major Asian city, uh, it would be every day. So that's the thing that surprised mm -hmm. me, very clean, very low crime rate, oh, very, very, good. very safest cities. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and is there anything you wish you had known earlier? Well, the, the thing I wish I had known earlier would be this, and I'm speaking this because I'm a person from India, that I should have learned Persian, how close Tajik was to Persian language and how easy it would be for someone from the subcontinent um, like Pakistan or India to learn Persian because there's like 5,000, 7,000 long words. And if I had known that earlier and I spent some, you know, some time studying that because it took a while to get the work visa, I, I, I would have been able to communicate much earlier or easier um, with Tajik people. Uh, Persian is so easy for someone from the subcontinent because, um, you know, the frequency of long words being used in, in, this, in, in the same objects. And, and OK, so the other thing was um, how pretty, how pretty Tajik girls are. Oh. <laughs> you know, I remember I was in Russia. I was in Russia. Yeah. And so one of my um, colleagues was a Canadian blonde man of Nor Norwegian origin. And he was like, so we, we were there. And one day uh, we were, you know, after work or at the weekend, I can rent some party. I remember he told me, dang, I wish I'd known about how pretty Russian girls were. I would have come here when I was 22. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you see, yeah. if I know no pretty Persian girls, well, yeah, I would have come here when I was twenty-two. Because <laughs> I think um, Persian girls here make excellent wives, very, very family-centric, very focused on um, on having an ideal family. That that's a very good thing. That's one thing I admire about Tajik culture. You know, being um, Eurocentric and Western-leaning, I guess my value system is very closely aligned with Western standards. So I, I'm, you know, all, my life is all about self-actualization. So I've never really looked too much at um, family life and, you know, all the other things which I see so, so strongly embedded in Tajik society. So uh, these are things that I had to relearn. I respect them. Yeah. And do you think Tajik language is easy to learn because you speak Russian, Tajik, so you can compare? Mm -mm -mm. Yeah, I think for a person, um, 
because we in India and Pakistan, especially, I don't know about the Arab people, mm-hmm. uh, we have a very, um, you know, long and ancient ties with Persia. Um, the, you know, the, um, the Mughal Empire, Persian influence in India, especially North India. So anyone who speaks a reasonable Hindi or Urdu would find it extremely easy to learn Persian. So I, I think Tajikistan um, is, is a great place to practice that because, you know, Iran is, of course, a lot more difficult to operate in. Uh-huh. Do you need to speak Tajik to live in Tajikistan or speaking Russian is enough? Um, I think it depends on your purposes of, of, uh, of language learning. If you just want to be um, someone who's working in an international organization, uh, just spending time in the capital city or in Hujan, which is the second capital, and just walking in the urban areas, uh, living in the high street, Russian should be okay because, um, you know, uh, most of the elite in, in, in the Soviet countries, post-Soviet countries speak Russian commendably well. But if you really want to see, you know, and experience a slice of the authentic Tajik life, you must learn Tajik because, um, you know, you step if you step into a car and drive like, well, it's a small city, if you drive 15, 10, 5 kilometers out of the cities, five kilometers from Hujan, 10 out of Dushanbe, you might come to villages where no one speaks Russian or speak Russian very badly. And yet, if you speak a few sentences of Tajik, it opens a whole new dimension <laughs> of experience, cultural yeah. experience. Yeah, that has been my experience. And Tajiks, let me remind you, gentlemen, though you are Tajik, are extremely hospitable. So you can wake your way mm-hmm. into your the most decrepit village, and you go there and say a few words in Tajik and tell them you're a traveler or something. They will just like, take you to their house and just shower you with everything, with every good thing they have. <laughs> yeah, so that, yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I like how you describe it. <laughs> mm. There's one more thing we wanted to ask you. Um, one of our listeners, he emailed us. Um, he was asking, um, is that okay if he's, okay, He's he wants to work in Tajikistan, but he's gay. Okay. So do you think society will accept that and will not judge him? Um, you know, uh, I think that's um, it's a very uh, good question you've asked me, says, um, because, you know, uh, being, you know, an academic director, I should hire people to come and work and do some international staff to work in one of our schools. Mm-hmm. Um, personally, you know, one's orientation, sexual orientation is one's own business. It really has nothing to do with us as employers, but because of... Um, societal restrictions or, you know, um, temperament, one has to be careful not to flaunt it. I think if you have a sexual orientation, that's your personal problem, what you do with it, it's all right, it's nothing to do with me. But I think if you uh, remember the fact you're in a conservative society which hasn't had too much interaction with the Western world and you live within uh, a certain framework, you shouldn't have problems. But if you go around, and, and, you know, flaunt it in people's face, and it's offensive in this culture, please not, at this time, maybe 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, it might be different, but at this point in time, it is deeply offensive to most people in this society. Mm-hmm. And so if you do that, then it, obviously there will be some sanctions and repercussions. But if you just want to come and live quietly and mind your business, and please note, I'm I'm a black man, I'm living in this society for, for um, nine years. I never, ever had trouble with anybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not even Muslim, I'm Christian, so, you know, it just depends how you live your life. You live your life peacefully, try your best not to be offensive to your neighbors in, in the general community, I don't think you should have a problem. Mm. Wow, thank you. Yes. Is Tajikistan an expensive place to live? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I, I wish I could put my hand on my heart and tell you, yes, yes, that's true. No, <laughs> um, what I've noticed is that, you know, when I first, I'll give you a live example. So when I first came here to the city, I got in a, in a you know, little van, which they call Marshutkas, and the cost <laughs> of the fare yeah. was, was 80 dirhams. Oh, and wow. today it is two, two Simonis, two Simonis okay. on a bus, yeah? In Dushanbe, it's two Simonis in the state bus and 450 or something in these other private bus thingies. So the cost of living has gone up. However, I'll just point out the exchange rate. When I came here, uh, four Simonis and 80 dirhams was the cost of a dollar. Today, wow. the cost of a dollar is, yeah, 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 today the cost of a dollar is about 11 Simonis and 25 dirhams. 
Wow. So I'm paying, when I pay two Simonis, mm-hmm. um, when I'm paying two Simonis, I'm paying a dollar, no, I'm paying 12 or 18 cents. Am I right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think if you look at 80 dirhams when it was 50 dirhams to a dollar, uh, 10 cents, so I think the cost of the thing is the same. Um, so I think it's very cheap to live in because, you know, this summer, uh, I have a two-month holiday because I'm a school teacher, but mm-hmm. I just stayed in, in Tajikistan because, you know, of COVID restrictions and stuff and flights being expensive. And I found it cheaper just to live here and rent a nice apartment and you go swim in the pool and do nothing. Yeah. Uh, so then, then to travel to, you know, say Georgia where I live and, 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 and you know, live in Tbilisi. So, yes, if you just want to, if you have like a gap year, you have three months, two months, a month off from school and you want to chill in you know, an inexpensive place. Uh, Tikstan would be your place to go, closely followed by Kyrgyzstan, which is also quite cheap, yeah. but has entirely different set of options to offer because um, they are both mountainous countries, but they are slightly different in what they offer. Mm-hmm. I see. So in average renting, can you say like like in average? Oh, yes, $200, $200 in, 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 in a high straight, high straight place, $200. Uh, two room flat, okay. uh, $150 for a, a studio. Yes, it's not good. Uh, a, a meal in it would be two dollars. <laughs> a, a meal in a good, um, good restaurant. A meal in an expensive restaurant would be five dollars. Ah, okay. Yeah, McDonald's would be five dollars or four dollars. At four dollars, I think. You, you mean uh, Tajik McDonald's? Chicken burger, chips. Yeah, Taj burger. Uh, the Tajik McDonald's would be like four dollars. Um, a nice big burger for like three dollars, a cola, and chips for the other the change. So about four dollars. Cola's like fifty there fifty cents. The chips is probably fifty cents too. Very nutritious and organic. May I add? I'm a huge fan of organic food. And um, actually, for any of your foreign friends who really want to know more specific information for relevant to foreigners, um, they can find me on the Hujan Expat Group which is a forum we run on Facebook mm-hmm. um, for all foreigners. And not just me, but there are all the other foreigners who ever live there. And we, we have between us a large corpus of information okay. for any um, future expats who want to live here. What do you think foreigners should buy before coming to Tajikistan? What do you think it's hard to oh, find yeah, in Tajikistan? A, yeah, that's a good question. What, do, what should a foreigner bring? that you won't find easily or very expensive, yeah. yeah. Um, especially if you come from the Western world, you might want to bring like, you know, perambulators for children, prams. Um, you might want to bring very large size shoes if you're <laughs> like a Caucasian male with size 46. Because, okay. you know, I've been trying to help my Canadian Canadian associate over here. He's size 47. I've got a British guy who's size 45. It's quite hard to find very large size shoes. The average Tajik men wear shoes between 40 to 43. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, so yeah, if you, if you have very large size um, legs, um, you, know, sh- you know, you should bring it from your own country of origin. Um, also, um, clothes are relatively cheap, especially if they come from China, moderately expensive if they come from Turkey. If you want something better than that, then you better bring it from your home country. But I've been here for a while and I travel. And I am generally happy with, the spots clothes which you can get from China, from the, from the big Chinese brands, very decent quality. Yeah. Half the price of Adidas. You do not get Nike, Adidas, Puma um, kind of products here. So if you're really an enthusiast and you really need those things, you should bring it from your own country. Um, same goes for electronics. You don't you don't get a lot of high end electronics here because it's a low income country. So if you like, you want to buy an, a MacBook or something, there's just like one shop in the capital city. That sells it, and it's quite quite expensive compared to America, Europe, or Hong Kong, Singapore, something like that. I suggest you get high end electronics from your country, but low end electronics, mid end electronics are very cheap here because they all come from China and Dubai. That's how they say. <laughs> well, no, the Chinese, you, yeah. no, 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 the, the low end Chinese, you know, like products. You you can get like very cheap Chinese phones. Oh. You can get cheap Chinese Bluetooth speakers. So low end and mid end, you can get very quickly in Tajikistan. You see, high end, that is a problem. Food is very good, organic, very meat based. Vegetarians, you might want to bring some, you know, and uh, bring some of your ready to make vegetable stuff from even the Indians and Southeast Asians, you know, Malaysia, Korea. You know, in the in the recent years, especially in, in the capital, 
We have large shops that cater to these communities, the Indians, Pakistanis, Iranians. Okay. They are, they're Afghan traders who are bringing in spices and all the things for these uh, cuisines. Same for Korean, um, Chinese, Japanese. You can get bottle sauces, fixes in, in, in supermarket in Dushanbe. Probably here too in a market called Doro. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And the last question, anything that you admire about the Tajik culture and you wish your culture would have that? Oh, that's a difficult question because you're just narrowing me down to one thing. But there are quite a few things I like <laughs> okay, about culture. Okay, maybe a couple of things. Yeah, okay. Um, the first thing that I would like, um, I admire great, I would like to have seen in India, um, would be the fact that in your universities, students are forced to dress in formal clothes all oh, through the four yeah. years of study. And mm -hmm. you have prescribed dress codes. Now, I, I think that is very good because it inculcates a sense of discipline. Mm. In the students, they have to shave, they have to wear a suit, they learn to wear a tie. Um, I compare that with the subcontinent and the Pakistan where people loiter in jeans and stuff. And so they have this very, you know, there's no sense of discipline. The other thing I like is this deep sense of nationalism. Real or imagine that your country, you know, fosters in their people. Because you teach uh, patriotism and nationalism as a subject in your, in schools. Mm. And like, I wish I, I saw more of that. Of course, the Indians and Pakistanis are, are nationalists in their own way. But in your in your country, it's systematic. They teach you what it is to be a patriot. They teach you what patriotism means. So you know what you should do if you want to prove you're a patriot. It's not just like going and fighting in the wars and things like that. So I like the sense of, you know, national identity and service to the nation and the larger community at large, which is taught in Tajikistan. I don't see that kind of, you know, especially with the rich young Indian kids um, in, in India. I see that, you know, they, they, they are very self-centered and self-focused and and really don't care about the larger picture of their nation so that's one thing i admire and the other thing i admire is the strong focus and on family and, and and respect for older people service to the community for example in your country maybe it's in other soviet countries too but it's not there in india which is considered a free and democratic country in principle um is that your your schools require your children to go out on a certain day of the month. It's called sanatoria. Oh, and they make Saturdays. them clean the street in front of this. No, they make them know. One day, I don't know if it's every day, but I've seen like Lenin school. The uh -huh. teacher comes out with the kids, makes them clean the street oh, in yeah. front of their school. That could maybe be the reason why Hujan in, in Tajikistan seems to be much cleaner, even though India, Bangladesh, and even Pakistan have like higher levels of income. Yeah. It's because this is not inculcated the sense of cleanliness, especially in small children. So they just grew up throwing wrappers here and there, throwing mm -hmm. things out of the car, bottles and stuff. And it's created such a big problem with littering and garbage in the subcontinent. So I would like to see that. I would, I really want to see that. And um, I, I think the other thing is that um, Tajikistan and Tajik people, because it was being a low income country, are, 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 are never, um, one to shirk work they're always ready to work hard and and very enterprising so that that is a good thing mm -hmm. there should be more of that in other places india the countries i call home yeah mm -hmm. i see no 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 sense of entitlement like please give me some money or please help me because i'm poor but everyone's like trying to to do some something you know have a hustle they say in america mm. yeah sounds good <laughs> uh Anything else, Mr. Daniel, you would like to share before we come to the close? I think um, I'm very happy to say, because I've traveled a lot in Silk and quite a bit in, in central Tajikistan. I haven't been to the Pamir Mountains yet, but I've also been to Katlon. Um, that Tajikistan has made, has made great progress in recent years, in the last three years, especially in terms of tourism and the amenities and the infrastructure, just, just taking a provincial viewpoint of Silk. Uh, you know, I see Aini as the border of Sirk. Now you drive from Hujan to Aini, you just look at the number of hotels that have been opened or are opening up in, in Sheristan. So, I mean, uh, many years ago we went there and we were in, in Sheristan, there was like, there were two resorts. Yeah. And there was no, no water in one of them. But in the recent past, this is I'm talking 2016, but uh, one of my British colleagues um, just went to a cabin in one of these places and it was like the internet, even internet, hot water, electricity, wow. warm baths. So, yeah, so, I mean, this is a good thing. This is um, something that should be talked about more that 
Tajikistan is working hard. You have a very easy visa system, electronic. Mm -hmm. You can you can get your visa online. Um, you ha you have more ports of entry, borders, uh, points of entry in your borders now. You can come in from Uzbekistan. You can fly in from uh, the, the capital city. You can cross the border in Kyrgyzstan, for example. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I think I think Tajikistan is definitely what a visit, if not more. I know I have many expat friends like me who've lived here four or five years and, and have got better jobs in, in major, um, you know, multinational organizations. But still, would they would like to buy a little house here just to visit once or twice a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, in Tajikistan, you can, as they say in CNN, feel the friendship. <laughs> feel the friendship. Yes, that's like a, mm -hmm. in a logo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's my take on my nine years. Yeah. I'm always open to receiving um, suggestions, comments, questions. Hujan the expat group on Facebook. You can email me um, yeah. at um, englishindian at gmail.com or you can find me on Instagram as Monsoon Daniel. Yeah, Mr. Daniel, thank you so much. Uh, mm. I think many foreigners who are planning to go that day, they will find this episode really useful because there is not much information mm -hmm. about Tajikistan, as you mentioned yeah. before. So. I hope Thanks a lot. I hope you guys do something to, to counter that. Yes, thank you. Have a nice weekend. I look forward to hearing and seeing more of you everywhere. <laughs> thank yeah, you. Thank you very much. Salamat <laughs> Boshet. Salamat <laughs> Boshet. If you enjoyed this episode, you might enjoy the episode about Trentino Alto Adige, which is in Italy, with our guest David Sverger. Here is the preview trailer. The main language we speak it's different from village to village or uh, valley to valley so that's why we have to speak in the official tvs in the newsletter or in school german and italian and there's a third language is latin it's a roman language but i, I to be honest i don't speak that it's a little bit uh, difficult <laughs>